this issue with Black Shield, because of the size of their investors and even the value of it, they tend to dictate the pace at which the conversation around the resolution, the liquidation process, uh, it's, it's ongoing and it's understandable. What, what will be the final end? Because they are in court obviously contesting your action. You also need to uh, make deal with the customers, giving governments a uh, commitment. What is the way out? I don't know how the court will determine the case. What I do know is what we are doing. And um, we are, um, I mean, the, the court case will, will, will continue. Now, we, we came out with a, a couple of press releases uh, over the last few weeks. And um, I know Black Shield also came up with one um, <coughs> rejoinder, if you like. And uh, in, that, in their statement, they indicated that they are supportive of the attempt by the SEC to ensure that their investors receive the government bailout. So in our subsequent um, press release, we also indicated that if indeed the um, Black Shield is uh, support you, then they must take concrete steps, you know, to ensure that there is no impediment uh, or there is no further delay in their investors uh, receiving government bailout. Because government bailout is proceeding on liquidation order and then validation of claims. Okay, so if you are telling uh, us that you, you support the exercise, then it stands to reason that then take the steps that would ensure that um, you know the claims uh, um, are validated and then um, there's also no impediment in the uh, liquidation uh, process. Because I said that we are following the liquidation pathway. So um, that is the way it needs to go. Liquidation order secured, claims validated. Does that include withdrawing their case from court? Because without that, the order obviously, uh, I wonder how the court is going to proceed in giving an order to any, to, for, for the Registrar General to liquidate a company which is contesting the revocation of its lines. Yes, that's why, <coughs> that's why I, I, I said that we said that if Black Shield is um, really um, committed to ensuring that the, their clients are able to participate in the government bailout without any further delay. Okay, and I'm choosing my words carefully because um, any delay to that process could also impact uh, when, the timing. You know, one of the points we tried to make in our press release was that no um, clients of these failed fund management companies are being excluded from the government bailout. I think that is an important point. There's, it's not a question of excluding anyone. It's a question of the timing because of the processes. You know, and, and I think you would do a good job if you let that message get out. That is a question of the process. You know, the process must be allowed to work because that is what it is so and th and that's why i i when you use a, uh, the phrase that you know why don't we want to include i said no it's not about we don't want to include. it's a question of the process because government bailout is for all affected investors of these uh, farm management companies who have failed and whose licenses have been revoked however we need to get claims validated and we need to have the liquidation orders. Now, let me come to the claim, because I think that's also important. With Black Shield, now, they gave data to our agent. Remember I said we, um, we appointed an agent to get data from, um, you know, claims from the clients, you know, and then we had to do validation. Now, in the case of Black Shield, they gave data to our agent that was only enough for them to um, validate or examine about 3% of the claims. You know, the actual number is 2,275. The data was given to, to our agent in Excel. We had the total number of claims filed against uh, Black Shield is 82,204. 
but the Excel data they gave um, was enough for examination of only 2,275. That's just about 3%. Mm -hmm. There was information that uh, we were asking for that. Look, give us more information because this is inadequate. Mm -hmm. uh, our agent, we, you know, we, we had information that there was some server that had more information and there was difficulty in um, getting the server until we had to use a law enforcement agency to enable us to you know, retrieve the server. You know, so now the agent has the server and has uh, begun the validation of the remaining claims. So again, in the case of Black Shell, the validation of the claims is not complete. And it's not complete because we had only limited data submitted to our agent at the beginning of the process. When did you get the complete data through the uh, law enforcement agency? Oh, I think in the middle of um, August. I can't remember the exact uh, date, 18th or 19th. I can't remember. The, the middle of um, August is when we got the... This is, this is also another impediment under your law, which has been cured by the BSDI to do with the banking sector. Because with the banks, once uh, a license is revoked, the central bank takes over. So that's why I said that we are looking at beefing up the framework within our act. We have something, but you know, someone said that the room of improvement is never full. In other words, you can always improve. So this particular uh, revocation exercise has, of course, uh, underscored the need for us to um, enhance the framework for resolving failed institutions uh, in our act. So that is something that we are going to uh, uh, pursue because I think you, you, your mind is coming to the fact that with the receiver, um, immediately the receiver is appointed, uh, the receiver takes over the assets and the abilities of the entity and starts operating. But in the liquidation pathway, it is only after the court has granted the official liquidator the um, liquidation uh, order that's when they take over the assets and liabilities. We have a provisional act. Which, which gives us the power to go for records, to search for records, to require records, to use the services of a law enforcement agency if we are not getting it. And, and that's what we did, because that's the power we have. So we, we have the power to ask for data. Uh, we, ask the, we have the power to go to premises uh, and, and make copies of data. And, and so we use that power. So we mandated our agent to go and lock up, make copies. Okay, But where, uh, let's say, uh, a, a server is not where the office is, uh, then you find that you can run into this um, you know, complication. With the Black Shield, I see two entrenched positions, and then uh, a victim, and then one referee, so to say. So second, uh, Black Shield, you are the, uh, the guys fighting, so to say. We are not fighting. <laughs> Okay. We, we are not. Uh -huh. Yeah, but the customers or the investors at the end of the day are the beneficiaries or sufferers of the, the actions from the two of you. And the law court is the determinant of whatever decision will be taken. What should the customers do now? What should the law court do? I think we have made it clear that it's a question of time. Um, you can't rush some of the legal processes. Um, we've already made a, a lot of progress, like I'm saying, you know, when it comes to securing the liquidation orders. I think what the clients, and, and it's not just Black Shield clients, yes, they may be in the majority uh, because uh, they represent about 84%, 83% uh, of the total number of claimants. But all the other claimants where the liquidation orders have not been secured, all we are saying is that um, government has committed to providing you a bailout based on your validated claims. Okay. Today it is the turn of Mr. A or Mr. B. Tomorrow it will be your turn. So it's not like you are being denied. So it's not about, uh, you know, the, a victim, you know, kind of situation. What, what has happened is that government has made a very good decision to provide this bailout, okay? 
government is saying that let's have the claims validated. Let's get the liquidation orders, roll out the bailout package. It's, it's, it's a question of time. So no one should feel like they are being excluded. It's a question of where are we in the process. And I think I said earlier that for the 22 that the liquidation orders have been secured, uh, the process is ongoing. This week, the official liquidator is meeting the, uh, uh, the, the, the clients. It's called the class meeting for investors, meeting them after meeting them, the official, official liquidator is going to explain the processes because if government is bailing out, you need to assign your uh, interest or your claim to the government because government is giving you the money, so government is taking your place. So you need to execute the agreement for that to, to happen. So the official liquidator will take the investors through. And I think that is a testimony to the fact that what government has promised to do, government is taking steps to do it okay so it's a question of time and i would encourage um, all the affected investors including those of black shell to um, exercise a little more uh, patience i know and and i've heard stories and i've actually seen people who are in a lot of distress because their monies are locked up and and um, you know my heart goes out to all such people who are you know, been hit by this situation of having their funds locked up. Uh, and I, I'm just appealing that um, it's good to know government is stepping in. Uh, let's allow a little time and um, the processes will, you know, um, you know, work through and then uh, people would receive the bailout. If you take the validation uh, process, um, you know, as at the time we came out with our press release, the, we had full records for 40 of the companies and validation was completed. Uh, apart from Black Shield that we had partial, uh, there were six others that um, we had difficulties. My information is that I think w with the exception of one, uh, First Bank, which is in court, um, you know, the, there's a lot of progress. I think two or three are completed and two are ongoing. So the validation we are working on, it. and even the black shirt, we've told the uh, agent to accelerate the validation process. So we are taking the steps to complete the validation process. Unfortunately, legal vacation came in uh, along the line. And um, so for August, September, um, you know, the courts uh, generally are not sitting. For the affected clients of these 22 firms, they will, they will hopefully start receiving the bailout from next week because when the official liquidator uh, meets them this week and outlines the uh, details, I'm aware that the official liquidator will provide a time frame within which um, they uh, would um, you know, begin payment. Indeed, when she met the creditors last week, you know, quoting her, she, she said by end of September, you know, the payments would, would begin. So, so clearly, uh, there's going to be some action soon. So if it's not your turn today, it will be your turn tomorrow. So it's not a question of exclusion. If it is not your turn today, it will be your turn tomorrow. We are still here discussing the, the securities industry, the reforms with uh, the Director General of the Commission, Reverend Daniel Obamitete. Reverend, the reforms taking place are happening in the, the player sector. Within the exchange, are there other reforms taking place? Because the impression or the conclusion from what is happening is that there were one or two defects or delays in taking certain decisions that led to where we are. A, a, a case in point is uh, the issue of guarantee returns. I know very well it first came up around 2014, it was shelved, and then you had to take it up. Within the exchange, what are we doing different to ensure that these reforms outside are entrenched and do not resurface? Okay, so let me talk about a number of things that um, we are doing. And uh, maybe along the line, you notice that I would disagree with some of the um, comments that you made as you were posing um, this, uh, this question. So I'll take it in a number of ways. So number one, I'll talk about the licensing 
um, regime. Now, licensing is very critical because that is what gives you and mm -hmm. the um, opportunity to play mm -hmm. in the uh, space. Mm -hmm. So we are going to make our licensing regime more robust. Okay. okay. We will be issuing out licensing guidelines, which raises the bar mm -hmm. uh, to make sure that only people, only persons mm -hmm. that are fit and proper, mm -hmm. are allowed to operate mm -hmm. in the um, in the securities mm -hmm. uh, industry. industry. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we are going to tighten the licensing regime mm. that is very very important what, what aspect of the licensing regime needs to be tightened okay so uh, let me give you just one example uh, the minimum capital requirement mm -hmm. now um, currently you need hundred thousand Ghana to uh, get a license that's the minimum capital required to get a license as a fund manager mm. for instance hundred thousand mm. you, you would agree with me um, it's not difficult to uh, come by, you know. Mm -hmm. So we have raised it uh, from um, 100,000 for the farm manager to 2 million, okay? Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, so it's one of the things that we we are, are throwing in. Then another important thing is the fit and proper. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we are going to be looking at the directors mm -hmm. um, and we have to approve that. I mean, hitherto we're not approving um, you know, directors mm -hmm. of, of these um, firms. So we are going to look at that. So, so that's what I mean by tightening. We mm -hmm. want to make sure that fit and proper persons are operating mm -hmm. and they're not every Tom, Dick and Harry can mm -hmm. just come in and get a license. So mm -hmm. we are going to raise the bar mm -hmm. uh, so that things that you need to meet before mm -hmm. you get a license uh, are tightened. Mm -hmm. And we're going to have a, 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 a framework mm -hmm. that defines the issuance of licenses. So once we issue the licensing guidelines, I think there'll be more visibility on all the details in the uh, licensing framework. But that mm. is a key area mm. because, mm. you know, we're talking about farm and real company, we revoke their license. So it's about how you get a license in the first place. Mm. And of course, if you don't go by the uh, principles or expectations that go with the license, then we will have to pull the plug and, and take the license back. So the license is one of them. Then we can talk about supervision. Mm -hmm. Okay, we do off-site and then on-site supervision, on-site and off-site um, supervision. And um, we are, again, tightening it. Uh, we are, for instance, introducing risk-based supervision framework. Now, we typically have been using compliance-based uh, supervision framework where you, we basically it's like you have a checklist and you make sure that it, this is in place that that's in place and, and all that but a, a richer approach which many jurisdictions are using is a risk-based uh, framework where you focus on where the um, you know Im emerging risks are so that your supervision is tailored and you're able to um, you know pick the signals early and then you take the, uh, you know, the action. So we, we are tightening the supervision mm -hmm. uh, framework. So that's another thing that we're doing. Then we're also uh, embarking on a digitization program. Mm -hmm. Now, again, we, we currently run a very manual system, mm -hmm. okay, receiving of the returns filed by the mm -hmm. market operators, mm -hmm. Um, and analysis and all of that and you know it's clear if you are running the manual process um, efficiency will not be at the optimum level okay so we have initiated a digitization program uh, so that returns can be submitted to the um, to the Commission uh, digitally and then the analytics can also uh, you know, work, you know, you know, towards greater uh, efficiency, um, you know, in the, um, you know, the, the, the execution of our mandate. Um, so we, we actually embarked on, on this um, project in 2018, uh, but again, it's processes because <laughs> you need to go through uh, a number of stages. But 
thankfully we are close to, we had to get a consultant who had to come in before that you had to go through a certain tender process. You know, all of that I talked about in the processes. But we are um, at the stage where we are going to do procurement, you know, so we are close. But ahead of that, uh, our in-house IT team have been able to develop uh, some interim solution that would enable or allow the market operators to submit um, information electronically. So it's, it's an interim solution and we're hoping to roll that out uh, from the beginning of October. Okay, so that has to do with the uh, digitization uh, so uh, program. Of 20, next year against this year we'll go through this uh, interim. Oh, the, the, you know, the returns are submitted, they are quarterly, they are monthly submissions and then they are uh, semi-annual and then so it's all the returns. Now whether it's monthly or quarterly, you can submit it um, electronically and then it's, it's easier. Okay, so that's on the digitization uh, program. We're also coming up with guidelines which will deal with the regulatory framework. Uh, and let me mention some of them. We're coming up with investment guidelines. Okay, now well, one of the areas in the investment guidelines that we're about to issue deals with how fund managers can conduct themselves when it comes to um, related party transactions because it was evident from the exercise that we have done that a lot of the challenges came because uh, of related party transactions. So fund manager A has this company and then they, when they take the money from the client, they create uh, an instrument, they'll call it structured finance or call it commercial paper or call it uh, a debenture, call it something that has a capital market. and. You know, when it comes to related party transactions, um, if, if you are not, um, you know, being very professional, then you find that, you know, you do things that, I mean, you follow the process. And, and so it's not surprising that a number of the assets of these um, fund management companies were at risk. So the investment guidelines that we're about to issue would uh, deal with the, um, the, the, the issue of related party transaction, the process you must go to, through, it puts a limit you know, on how much you can uh, commit to related party uh, uh, transactions. How much are you looking at the limit? Oh, I, 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 don't, I, I don't recall it uh, 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 offhand, but um, it, it will be in the investment guidelines. Um, but a reasonable uh, percentage and let me also say that typically before we even issue guidelines we do engagement with the market so it's not like we are throwing something that is uh, a surprise so uh, the, the figure in there is is um, is, is something, something that the market, the, the market has it. seen okay does that those guidelines do they include the proportion of funds that can be invested in the credit you talked about earlier, that uh, about 50% of uh, 5 billion of the 8 billion that uh, you saw earlier was invested in more or less given out as loans and all that. Does it clarify that issue too? It, it clarifies the underlying assets that um, you need to invest in. But maybe let me just clarify this for you. Mm. You know, when it comes to investment mm. you have a number of asset classes okay if you take investing pension funds the regulator has come up with some guidelines which says that pension funds cannot be invested uh, in these asset classes okay it's clear when you take the collective investment schemes you take mutual funds you take um, unit trust. There's an LI, LI 1695. That also is clear on what um, asset classes or what investments cannot uh, be included in the portfolio of the mutual funds or the unit trusts. Okay. But you find that in the asset management space, you can have an institution, you can have a high net worth that would engage a fund manager, okay? Now we are saying that the, f the job of the fund manager is to understand the expectations and then the risk 
profile of the investor and create a portfolio okay that meets it now if you are let's say a high net worth client and you have appetite for high risk investment okay no one should stop you okay so one of the things we emphasize is that there has to be adequate disclosure which wasn't the case uh, especially for um, you know the firms that have <coughs> run into difficulty because Disclosure to the clients as to where their money was going wasn't done. Now, you must let the client know that, okay, this is where you know, the funds are going to be invested. If you take collect investment schemes, we have, by law, you must have what, what is called the scheme particulars, which you specify the underlying investment. But you see, what uh, some of the fund managers were doing, they were just promising returns without letting the clients know where they were going to invest. And then on the back of that, they take very risky decisions. So we are saying that there has to be disclosure. But if you are the asset owner, you are the high net, and, and you have the appetite for a certain kind of investment, as a regulator, I won't say that don't, don't do that. I'm saying to the farm manager that you are a professional. Let the client know that this is the risk return trade-off. And if the client is satisfied, let the client sign off. Because we all differ in our ability to handle risk okay so we are emphasizing that um you know one there has to be disclosure and then um there there has to be limits in terms of um you know exposure to certain categories so that's why for instance i mentioned that when, when it comes to related party transactions we are limiting the the exposure but the core of it is that there has to be adequate disclosure to the client, so that the client knows. This is for funds that are, are, are managed um, under a discretionary uh, mandate. Because when it comes to CI, CI the collective investment schemes or pension funds, there the, the are clear rules. But where the rules are not there, that's where we are bringing in um, you know, these guidelines. And it's important for the asset owners to sign off. It shows that you agree Okay, but actually, you know, when we um, came up with a directive for the farm managers to stop guaranteeing return, we told them that we are directing that either you are managing funds for high net worth clients where there's a clear mandate signed so that the underlying investments are clear, the risk return trade off is clear, or creates a collective investment scheme where the uh, law is there, again, there are clear guidelines, and then invest uh, the funds in the collective investment scheme. Because we believe that you know, the governance structure, even of the collective investment scheme, is better. Because if you take a mutual fund, there's a board. And the board will be holding the manager accountable to comply with asset allocation that is, for instance, in the scheme particulars. Okay, so so that is where we are headed to get the 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 the, 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 uh, the farm managers to make use more of the collective investment, uh, um, you know, vehicle collective investment schemes vehicle, you know, to use that more. But where it's high net worth clients, they have to sign an investment uh, agreement where the underlying investments or the un underlying assets are clear, the risk return trade-off is clear. That when it comes to CIS, there's no problem. When it comes to pension funds, th there's no problem because there are rules. So that is what we are, we, we are looking to, 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 to achieve. Now, the other thing that we'll be issuing is what we call conduct of business guidelines. And that will deal with things to do with governance because, again, you know, these firms corporate governance was very weak you know some from the composition of the board uh, as well as the um, the fact that boards must have comp committees you know boards are effective when they have subcommittees committees that are working okay so we are, we are, we are the, the conduct of business guidelines will be strengthening um, the um, the practice of governance in in these uh, firms. It also touches on, you know, the directors and what kind of directors. So it, it, it deals with what is expected of the uh, market to print when it comes to um, running business. And then we also have the financial resources guidelines, which uh, will have provisions on 
uh, you know, the capital liquidity, because uh, liquidity and, um, you know, the uh, capital required, they, they are critical things to uh, when you are talking about a firm managing uh, funds, for instance. I mean, if uh, operating the securities industry for that matter, because um, if you have a tight liquidity situation, uh, that could impact your ability to, to deliver, um, you know, to your, 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 your client. So, so these are uh, some of the, um, yes, that, yes. The issue of capital, when, when is it going to be effective, the two billion, two million? We, 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 we intend to issue the guideline within the um, coming weeks. We, we are actually targeting, um, you know, by the end of September or early October. So we'll be issuing the, um, the, investment, the licensing requirements. That's what contains the, the capital, um, the minimum capital required. Uh, we're, we are projecting that by the end of September or early October, we, we should be able to come out with the, um, the licensing requirements. And then the other guidelines I'm, I'm, I'm making um, reference to. When it comes to the capital, do they have a, the existing companies, do they have a time frame? They would have a time frame. They would have a time frame. Um, we would grant them uh, up to the end of 2021 uh, to um, meet up. But for those that are going to seek to come into the market, um, it will be immediate. In other words, if you are a, a prospective uh, entrant into the securities industry, um, the new levels is what would apply. Mm. Mm. So effectively one, in one year, the three months for them yeah, to comply. Right. Okay. Yeah, is, right. is this something you took the opinion of the industry? What, what was their response? You know, we actually again started this uh, a while back. So we've done a lot of engagement with the industry. Actually, we even started um, when we engaged the ministry, uh, sorry, the industry at five million. And then there was uh, feedback from the industry to bring it lower. So there was a bit of back and forth. And then we've also engaged with other, um, you know, stakeholders. So we have, um, done an extensive engagement so it won't come to the market as surprise i think the market has been waiting for it and um, we've had you know a few um, if you like issues that uh, we've had to resolve i wouldn't want to get into all the details but we are at the point where we should be able to um, issue it uh, this year and like i said we'll give the existing operators up to the end of 2021 uh, to be fully compliant. How can a company capitalize? What, what will constitute capital under your uh, requirements? Well, the details will be in the financial resources guideline. So, and again, that we also, um, we also shared with the, the market. This very decision, the revocations of the lines and then the aftermath and all that, one of the implications is polit political. It, it has political connotations and this is an election year. You should be concerned that your, your, your institution, it's, its decision is having a political implications that could impact the government. Are you, have you been worried by people or by yourself that this decision which I took in uh, the wider interest of society is beginning to take a political dimension.